to um, Texas. We're in Phoenix, Arizona at the moment at the uh, HQ of Coastal Guitars and here we are with, uh, well, basically a vehicle full of beautiful instruments and uh, quite a lot of Coastal Guitars t-shirts. <laughs> We've got a Humphrey amplifier in the back so we can make some noise. Uh, some uh, guitar take stands, stand. take a yeah. stand guitar stands and uh, we're off to Spring Branch. So the, uh, the idea is that we're going out to see a man by the name of Tom Bowersox who's uh, very kindly decided to put on uh, a beautiful guitar festival in his home. <laughs> so come and join us and... Uh, Are I'm we sure. there yet? <laughs> Not just yet. Hey, you lived in Texas for a minute, didn't you? What's it like? It's different. We are going to McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, it's right over there. This, uh, this is something of a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. the, the McDonald's <laughs> breakfast. It, it certainly was for me. Um, contrast. Should you be recording this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> contrast. Oh, you are recording this. Yeah, oh. Recording this. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, that's something that springs to mind when I think of you. McDonald's? Well, not just McDonald's, <laughs> but if, if you think about the context, okay, um, you have a reputation as somebody who uh, enjoys the finer things in life, a bit of a bon viveur, if you will. Yes. Um, including really good food. Including really good yeah. food. Well, that's, that's my next point, you know, yeah. you, you are often seen... Which is why we're going to McDonald's. <laughs> that's why we're going to McDonald's. <laughs> so, this is kind of a workout, right? Because what it's going to do is challenge your heart challenge your body and force them to kind of raise above their normal operating level in order to continue to function properly so in a lot of ways you're improving your overall health mm -hmm. in the same way that you you know stress your muscles and things like that with a workout so exactly you know what we're doing is just basically forcing your body to find its you know its limits and then rise above them. Well, it's re so it's responding we're to like stress, endurance isn't athlete, it? athletes yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's, that's I I will about. say that I'm impressed because you know as we've talked about when you first started coming here you were kind of like a one avocado and tea guy. Yep. And um, you know you realize there's no happiness in that. <laughs> the nun was and, and so you know as you've continued to come here to the states I have been impressed that you've started to get one, two, three entrees. Um, <laughs> I've never had three. Yeah. The, the impressive thing was when we went to Whataburger the other night and I got the double hamburger and you got the triple hamburger yeah. and then proceeded to eat the whole thing. And it was, I mean, that was even beyond my level of, hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, it's a little coke. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so... Well, there's, uh... Like, you deserve a pat on the back. Thank you. I, I needed a pat on the back. I needed someone I to just you needed hold a win. me. <laughs> I needed a win. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough, the gloom and doom of living in the UK, you know, and then you come here, it's like sunshine, rainbows, unicorns. And, I've noticed that. And fast food. And, and fast food, yeah. Yeah. I go to you know I go to England and I walk around and I'm like all there is here is falafel <laughs> and you know different curries and chicken tikka masala and right. um, although I will say that the proper English breakfast is my favorite meal on the planet. But well, exactly. Thank you. Understandable. So See, you that's, that's, that's got some heft to it. And uh, presumably there's, there's some sort of. Chesterfield sofa or somewhere where we can sit down to enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got things to do.
from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Okay. They have uh, Las Cruces, White Sands. There's a couple places in New Mexico where the uh, government does a lot of testing. New, you know, airplanes, rockets, all kinds of uh, oh, wow. propulsion systems, that kind of stuff. So, um, one of the things that Las Cruces is known for is there's a I think a higher than normal percentage of people that have claimed to have seen UFOs and met aliens and things like that. And wow, really? A lot of it is attributed to the random testing that, you know, the Air Force and stuff like that does out here. Or maybe it's all UFOs and aliens. Who knows? So yeah, a lot of wide open areas, you know, mm -hmm. mountains. Um, so it's, it's an interesting place. first met so it's kind of our 10 year anniversary this year and um, I was trying to count up the guitar shows that we've done over the years we did two Montreal's right yep one Hillsburg uh -huh. two Berlin shows two Berlin shows Memphis Memphis Santa Barbara Memphis and Santa Barbara that's right and now Texas beautiful it's a lot of places that'll never be the same delayed for some reason but a real like six and a half hour delay and I was sitting there with Michael Chapdelein and this woman came up to me and said excuse me are you an ETA and uh, I was like I, I don't know what, what is that and apparently an ETA is an Elvis Presley tribute act <laughs> yeah because of your coiffed hair and guitar? <laughs> I think it was the I'm hoping it was just the guitar. And the fact that... Or was it the uh, white jumpsuit and beer belly? I mean, uh, you know, you just don't know. <laughs> I think it was a bit of both. And we'd been to Graceland uh, a couple of days before. Right. Um, in this, this beautiful trip that, uh, that Bob Singer had, uh, had arranged. Um, and in fact, I think we were the first private group ever to visit. That's correct. Well, not to visit. Um... Well, first to, private to group there. to ever eat there, yeah. Elvis they opened Presley's, it up. Uh, yeah. It was the first time they had opened up Graceland after hours mm. uh, for a private group. So that was kind of the big deal, is that they've never yes, done indeed. that before. And we had barbecue from uh, Elvis's own... Yeah, the place he used to get lunch from every day. Uh, which... Barbecue and spaghetti, which is what he <laughs> ate. I guess like I didn't have that much spaghetti week. but I had so much meat I started sweating and, and tripping out a little bit um, it's called happiness <laughs> that's what it was um, I, I, I went to the gift shop as well got myself a, some Elvis memorabilia as you do and I'd got this taking care of business sticker for my guitar case and I guess she'd seen that as well while we were there we didn't know this at the time 
but apparently there had been a gathering of, uh, of the world's finest uh, Elvis tribute acts and she was one of the judges and she'd written a book about Elvis and spirituality. I think there was some sort of leaning towards Mormonism or Church of Latter-day Saints kind of idea and, uh, and she showed me the, the program for the, for the competition and there were ETAs from all over the world of all shapes and sizes, great big Greek ones and, and little Japanese numbers and uh, it, was, it was quite... How did we miss that? I don't know. <laughs> it was quite disconcerting. And you know, the worst thing was, when I was about 21, 22, I was at college and I met uh, a music manager who wanted to cast me as a young Elvis tribute act. <laughs> and I've been really aggressive about this. <laughs> I was getting phone calls every day going, I think we can really do this. I think it's a great project. Put a great band behind you. I found a dude that looks like Scotty Moore. And I'm like, no. <laughs> oh, my So I just uh, just got a message from Paul Richards, yeah. the uh, California Guitar Trio. They're playing in Phoenix on the seventh. Seventh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I'll already be in London uh, by then, sadly. I'll be in Phoenix. You'll be in Phoenix. Will you, will you go and see it? <laughs> I will be going to see it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, next Sunday. Right. Well, Paul's just uh, taking delivery of one of your guitars, hasn't he? Uh, a couple months ago, yeah. He. Um, He's been using it on their current tour, and it's been working out really well for him. Fantastic. I'm oh, very pleased to hear it. Yeah, he has a 14 fret MDW. Actually, the first MDW that I did has a 14 fret. Wow. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. How did that work out with the, uh, the um, 14 fret neck joint? It worked out okay. I had to redo, you know, some of the, the brace locations and stuff like that just to account for the bridge being in a different location but it actually worked out great. I also had to uh, have a different case made because yeah. the Hoffy cases have a headstock uh, you know padding that, and it that secures padding, the headstock yeah. so when the headstock moves forward it throws off my normal MDW case so you had to redesign one. Well Jeff's good for that sort of stuff. Isn't yeah. You, know, you can rely yeah, on Jeff's it. been amazing. Um, I really enjoy working with him and uh, he's He's very responsive. It's nice when you call, you know, he's the one that picks up the phone and, you know, it's like, okay, we'll make it happen. So yeah, that's important. Yep. Excited to to hear it. He's been recording or working on music for a new album that's very heavily tied to that nylon string guitar, um, and it, it, that's kind of how it came about. To be honest with you, he um, he has a, a steel string OM of mine, right. and has been playing that for quite some time now. And as he explained it to me, you know his his roots. When I first started listening to him in the late '80s. Uh, his guitar playing was very Hedges-like um, and very guitar-driven. And over the years, he's adapted and, and matured, and, and his lyrical side is definitely, you know, going great. But as he's performed with different musicians and things like that, he's kind of um, 
reduced the guitar side of it to make room for the other people that he was playing with. Sure. Which, again, is a, it's a level of maturity, but it means that the really complex guitar parts that he was writing early on in his career uh, kind of took a backstage. And in, in recent times, he said that, you know, he's been able to kind of re... Investigate that side of his playing, mostly because That's the guitar cool. that he has right now allows him to do things that he hasn't done before, um, and that's a huge compliment. You know, it's yeah. one thing to to build a guitar for someone, and they say, "Hey, thanks, it's a great guitar, I really enjoy it," but everything kind of stays status quo. It's another thing entirely when a professional musician says, "You know, this guitar has opened up new." You know, doors for me or change the way that I perform or play, man, there's really no greater compliment. Mm. And so where the nylon string came about is basically Willie started writing a bunch of music again. And in his head, he was hearing some of it, you know, as being kind of a nylon string piece. And he's played in the past with a great string, uh, a group of, of orchestral musicians in Carpe Diem. Right. And what he wanted to do originally was essentially bring this music to them and play along with with an orchestral group. And so I think right. in his mind he felt like the steel string was going to be too much. Mm -hmm. And he started envisioning a nylon string with these. And so we started talking and he said, you know, have you ever thought about doing this? And I essentially said, you know, I really... I, I don't know enough about the classical guitar world um, to really know what makes a great classical guitar. I feel like in the steel string world we have these nylon crossovers which are kind of like yeah. you build a steel string guitar you put nylon strings on it and most people that are playing those guitars I don't think really have a definitive idea of what they're hoping to get out of it or what they want it to do mm -hmm. and so it was kind of an interesting conversation for me because I could tell that Willie wasn't really asking for just a standard nylon crossover but I also could tell he didn't necessarily want a traditional classical guitar mm -hmm. so I had to research I mean quite literally like probably about 60 different classical guitar makers and their bracing patterns and things like that and really try to compare the size of those guitars with the size of my guitar so I could try to find something that maybe would, would transition a little bit better. But I told Willie, you know, I'm very happy to build the guitar for you and go down this this route with you if you acknowledge the fact that I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> because it's one thing for me to say I feel very confident in my ability to build you a very good steel string guitar. That's what I listen to, that's what I play. And I have a reference for what things work and don't work. This was discovery learning. Sure. And I needed him to understand, you know, we could get to the end of this and I could be a complete hero or I could be a zero. You know, like we, we don't really know how it's going to turn out. And so in true Willie fashion, he's like, right on, let's do it, you know. And so I looked at the bracing and I adjusted slightly just to kind of account for you know, different things that I was looking for. Um, one of the things is obviously, you know, the idea that Willie's going to basically play in alternate tunings. Yeah, and exactly. a standard classical player doesn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. So you have a huge circle of rotation of the nylon strings in, in standard tuning, but you drop it down to C or something like that, and now it's a, a game changer. Yeah. Um, and, and like zero tension. Exactly. And so I really had to think through a lot of this stuff. And then if there's zero tension, how, how are you driving the top? Right. And do I want to do a pinned bridge, which was my original plan, until I realized the pins would basically all, you know, tr get drilled through the braces that I was using underneath. So, you know, then, okay, now I'm doing a regular, you know, a classical style bridge, but... I, I want the wide saddle, I want electronics, you know, things like that. So there's all these things that, like, I had to kind of overcome. Um, you know, peg head angle to have the right amount of tension versus... And, and your first slot head, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a complex thing. I guess it's funny because, you know, I used the MDW as the platform for it. 
but with the exception of the body shape being the same, it was a 100% redesign. And so I think when it was all done, everyone was like, oh, that looks nice, ooh, ah, you know. But I'm looking at it going, God, this was like a year of, of yeah, yeah, thinking through this stuff. And so I, I flew out to Milwaukee, I, I delivered it to them. And um, it's funny because neither one of us really knew what was going to happen, right? You know, it was just kind of like, well, I kind of crossed my fingers. And when I strung it up, um, I, I, was, I was very surprised. Um, I don't necessarily know that I had that immediate feeling of like, wow, this is an incredible guitar, but I was very kind of like pat yourself on the back, like, wow, like, good job, all right, like, you, you did something, and I felt pretty confident it sounded good, so then the next step was, you know, bring it to Willie, let him see, and um, I delivered it before a concert, he was doing a, um, an anniversary tour, and it was a big show, and, and so, you know, we met backstage before the show, and he, you know, was able to just kind of sit and play it for about 10 minutes, but then, you know, it was like, had, had to get ready for the show and everything else, so, you know, we didn't really focus much on the guitar, it was more like, here it is, take some time to play it, let me know your thoughts, so, um, you know, about a week later, we had a really nice conversation, and, you know, he was just like, I'm blown away by this thing, and, you know, I'm excited to really sit down and play it, um, we ended up tweaking the electronics a little bit, um, swapping out the original pickup for a different pickup. You know, that's the hard thing is that the the companies that I think are great pickup companies for the steel string guitar don't necessarily make great pickups for the nylon string guitar. That's very true. Yeah. And so we went with a steel string company originally, and then his guitar tech was like, well, let's try this. And he was able to use a different pickup that got a better response. Um, and now, you know, when I talk to him, I mean, he's like, this thing is just blowing me away. And he's super excited, and he's writing music on it and playing with it. So um, I haven't heard him perform on that guitar. He's still touring with the steel string because he's doing his normal repertoire. But he's writing all this music on the nylon string and hoping to record it soon. And um, as he starts to do that more formally, there'll be you know, YouTube videos and snippets of certain songs. I'm really sure. excited to hear how that pans out. Um, but it was, in all honesty, it was no different than working with you to create the MDW in the sense that, you know, we call ourselves custom guitar builders, right? But for the most part, everything falls into some kind of a cookie cutter approach. Sure. And, you know, custom is, hey, can I get this different nut width? Or um, can I do this or do that and you know yeah it's they're individual preferences but at the end of the day the guitar is pretty much built the same way we just make something wider shorter whatever um creating the mdw was about rethinking how i build a guitar how i brace a guitar and everything else and then taking that guitar and having willie say here's what i wanted to do and now having to to translate that into a nylon string and everything else. Well, that, you see, that's um, fascinating to me because when we first talked, I was telling you about my love of nylon strings mm -hmm. and how a lot of the characteristics in, you know, Fleta, Hauser, uh, Conde de Manos guitars that I played in the past, mm -hmm. I was looking for in a steel string. So, it, to my mind, to begin with, the MGW was already a nylon crossover mm -hmm. that just happened to have steel strings on it. Uh, so I'm extremely anxious to uh, to play this yeah. guitar. Willie, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's let's make it happen. I would I would love to uh, to hear you play that instrument. And I'd, you know, for purely selfish reasons, I'd like to uh, like to have a go myself. <laughs> steel string guitars yeah. you've done one nylon string guitar yeah what's next are you gonna build any arch tools I, I would love to um, just for my own pure enjoyment and, and 
you know, educational side of it. Um, it's hard, you know, I, I feel like when people come to me, what they're asking me to be is a subject matter expert in whatever it is that I do. And um, while I don't ever claim to know everything or be perfect at anything, I do feel like I have a, a really good understanding of the steel string guitar. And I stay pretty current with all of the electronics, the right. ideas, the concepts. Um, part of the reason I don't build electric guitars, which I, I really revere, I mean, I in some ways I feel like electric guitars are more beautiful for me to look at because you have colors, you have sure. woods. You can use a really horrible sounding tone wood that is visually beautiful, put it onto an electric body slab, mm -hmm. and it's not going to affect the tone that much. So you can do a lot of things with wood that in the acoustic side you'd be like, I can't use that, you know. Um, yeah, there aren't that many Buckeye Bill. No, and, and, and so I really enjoy the electric side. I, I don't build electrics for two reasons. One is everything that I find visually appealing in an electric guitar has already been done by somebody. And I don't feel like there's any value added to me taking three or ten different people's ideas, merging them together, right. and calling it my own if I can't really add something monumental to it. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is I'm not a subject matter expert in anything electric related. I haven't physically sat and played an electric guitar in decades. And so if somebody came up to me tomorrow and was like, I want to sound just like so and so, there's a good chance I wouldn't even know what musician they were talking about. And then once you figure out who they talk, what they're talking about, I haven't studied all the pedals that are out there, the amplifiers, the pickups, you know. And so, you know, it's like, can I really build an instrument that does what the client wants it to do? Sure. So if I ever build an electric, it's just going to be, this is what I built. You either love it or you don't, <laughs> but don't come asking me for specifics. And the arch top is kind of like that for me too. I, I really revere the arch top. It's one of the first instruments I ever looked at and thought, man, this is a beautiful instrument. And from a craftsmanship standpoint, it's kind of a hybrid of a violin and guitar. So you have the hand carving aspect of a violin and the voicing like a violin, but then you have the construction techniques of a guitar. And that appeals to me. The problem for me is I don't know what a good arch top sounds like. When I sit and play an arch top, um, I usually don't walk away going, oh my God, that was an amazing sounding arch top acoustically. I can often plug one in and I go, oh man, this sounds really good, and here's what I would play on it. But I'm a fingerstyle player, so I tend to play steel string acoustic fingerstyle pieces on an arch top as opposed to playing like fingerstyle jazz or something like that. So to my ear, the tonality is maybe not what I'm looking for. But then I hear a, a Wes Montgomery, a Joe Pass, any of these guys playing, and you're like, man, that's beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. And but I also realize so much of it is the musician, right? Mm -hmm. You could hand a, an accomplished, you know, Bucky Pizzarelli kind of thing, you oh, know, guitar right, to yeah. a guy, and it could be a, a $50 pawn shop guitar, and he's going to sound like the best jazz player you've ever you know, listened to. So it's, it's hard for me because when I think of these instruments, the craftsman side of me and the curious side of me wants to do it just to learn, to experience... But I have to be real careful because as I do stuff like that, it's funny, like, you know, my first ukulele, I built for a client of mine who asked me, um, well, he actually reached out and said, who would you recommend to build a ukulele? And I was like, I could build one. <laughs> and I then built one for his, his wife. And in my mind, it was like, well, I'm never going to do this again. It's a one-time thing. Well, then I had another close friend of mine who had been asking me to build him a ukulele for a while, and I didn't think he was serious. And so when I built the first ukulele, he actually was really hurt that I built a ukulele but wouldn't build one for him. So then I built one for him, and, you know, it was fun and it was great, and I don't think either one of them expected me to build the most amazing, world-class, mind-blowing ukulele. They figured anything that I do to it is going to be better than a shop built ukulele and probably be great but I have to be careful because when I do these projects even though in my mind I may think I'm never going to do this again there's a good chance that somewhere somebody wants me to do something like that right and I want to be able to 
exceed their expectations. You know, this nylon string guitar with Willie is a big thing like that. You know, I don't know that I could replicate it because when I was building it, I was building it as a one-off and I didn't sit down and take notes of everything. You know, I didn't sit and measure every single brace and what I did and why I did. So if down the road somebody's like, I want you to build me that guitar, I'd almost have to start from scratch. And when you do that, there's a better than average chance that it might not turn out the way that the first one did. And or it may turn out well, better. You never know. And yet, that would be a closer replication of Willie's first build, wouldn't it? Because yeah. that was started from scratch. And therefore, you'd be applying, rather than a load of numbers that you'd made notes of, That's you, true. you'd be applying that same open yeah. Yeah. approach to a new top, to new braces, and all yeah. that stuff. But that comes with an inordinate amount of time as well. Of course it does. And what, yeah. what's hard about that is you can't pass that on to the client. I mean, yeah. some people can. I don't. I choose not to. So, you know, something new, if that takes me six months of R&D, I'm not turning around and saying, well, it's $20,000 for my six months of time, and then it's another, you know, whatever for the guitar. Sure. Um, and so it's just hard because those projects, when you take them on, they have to be because you love them. And you have to kind of do it in your free time and see how it goes. So I would love to build an arch top just for my own enjoyment, give it a try. I've looked into taking classes and stuff like that. But I just think right now, you know, I, I still have a back order and there are people anxiously awaiting for guitars. And I, if I have a client that's asking for something, I feel more comfortable stepping into that that realm sure. but if I'm just doing it for fun then I feel like man, I'm wait I'm making all these people wait longer for their guitars just so I can right. like play and have fun so I have to be careful with that but who knows maybe someday mm -hmm. when it comes to our tops you, you do make a very good point that they I, I, I'd say set at least 70% of what's happening is coming from the player mm -hmm. you know and they in my own experience that's true with any guitar really well, yeah, but you really have to pull it out of, of an arch tool. You know, I've, in my personal experience, it's been much like yours. I, I prefer arch tops that have a bit more immediate acoustic friendliness to them mm -hmm. than something that is kind of standoffish. Like I, yeah. I love Linda Manza's work because there's a lot of um, almost flat top uh, feeling in there, especially the... Um, the one I, play, I played recently, the, the iceberg that she did for the group of seven, and she said that it was kind of voiced like a like a flat top. You know, there's there's a richness going on in there that you might not find in a De Cuesto, for mm -hmm. instance. But the look of the things, I mean, yeah, it, arch tops have always done it for me. Um, I, I remember seeing John Montalioni's uh, teardrop mm -hmm. in Montreal in, in 2009, and uh, you know, you, it was, I was almost in tears just looking at that thing. Dale Lunger's American Dream, uh, as well, I saw a picture, I still haven't seen a, an example in, in the flesh, but I, I saw a picture in a book years ago, and it stayed with me. They, they are such beautiful instruments. Yeah. It's interesting, I, um, as you saw at my house, I've got um, a 1935 Gibson Super 400, so it's the first year they were made. Yeah. And what's interesting about that guitar is for, in 1935, they made it with a narrower, uh, or a, yeah, a narrower body and a shorter scale. And they changed that in 1936. They went to a longer scale, wider body. Mm -hmm. And um, so what's interesting about that is that first year, the guitar is very warm. It has, it has a beautiful warm sound. Right. But at the time, people didn't want warmth. They wanted right, projection and they wanted, through, yeah, they oh, wanted yeah. To, to play in a big band um, and, and, you know, basically really drive this thing home. So they changed the, the, the way the guitar was made the very next year. And so when I play that, that to me is, it's this beautiful guitar because it's more like what I would want in a steel string, right? right. Like kind of that balance, that warmth. But what's interesting is on the arch top side, that was like, oh, like <laughs> what were they thinking? You know, um, they got that wrong. Didn't they? I, it's, it's really interesting. I was reading that the um, the average so the, the cost of the guitar in 1935 was $400 oh, 
but so the average annual salary in 1935 was sixteen hundred and eighty dollars or something and a home average home price in the United States at the time was just under four thousand dollars so that guitar was like you know that was a go big or go home thing like basically Gibson it was you know middle of the depression and they thought like we need to jump start this so let's just put something out there that like everybody is gonna be like wow but you think like you know that guitar was a third you know or a, a quarter of somebody's annual salary for you know for people and it's it's just mind-boggling to me to think that you know that back then coming out of the depression people were buying these guitars and and that they've, you know, withstood the test of time. The one that I have is 100% original, um, original case, you know, original pick guard, which normally, you know, those get replaced, tuners, things like that. But you sit and play it. It is original. Mm -hmm. They haven't crumbled into dust yet. No. No, it's all original. Um, and, and that's what's so special about it is it's like this piece of Americana. And when I sit and play it, I'm like, man, you know, there's not a lot of stuff from the early 19... 30s, you know, that we still have in our possession today that still, you know, works and, and does what it's supposed to do. So, um, you yeah, it's know, a, it's a pretty special guitar. And they weren't, there weren't that many made that year, so it's it's neat to, to like have that. You know? or so? uh, less than that. Really? Yeah. Um, they, as they progressed, they did batches. I think they, from what I've read, they, they built like five at a time. And I think the highest number of production they did was like 90 in a year. But early on, they didn't know if it was going to sell. So, you know, your first year, you don't take that quarter of an annual salary and say, let's just mass produce these things and see where it goes. Um, but it's, it's just, it's an exciting piece of our history. You know, it's no different than an 1800s Martin or a pre-war Martin. Um, 52 Tele. Yeah. Broadcaster. Yeah, I just... When we look at our history, you know, as, as guitar players, um, yeah, there's so many neat new things out there, and, and I'm much more of a shiny new guy than an old vintage guy. Me too. But anyway. yet, I can appreciate where we come from, and as a, as a watch collector, you know, um, and some of the things that I collect, what is fascinating to me is this idea that you know, a watch is a great example. Here we are 300 years after, you know, the first watch was really kind of created. And yeah, we have technology, you know, we have CNC, we have lasers and everything else, but we're still building it in, in, in inherently kind of the same way. And we're asking it to do the same thing. And the guitar is the same thing. You know, it's like, right. it's mind boggling to me that in this day and age, we're, we're just trying to do what we did 100 years ago and, you know, hope that we can do it you know, better or, or even, you know, as well as it. So, so owning guitars like that is always very special to me because you think of how many people, you know, that guitar has touched and music that's been written on it, played on it. You know, I mean, I always think, I, and I could be wrong, I don't know anything about it, but like, you know, I, we, guitar collecting is a thing now. I don't know that in 1935 guitar collecting was a thing. I you know, I, so. yeah, I, I mean, I just, I, I don't think collecting as a whole was really a thing, right? Like, even people with wealth were like, well, let's buy a new railroad or a new yeah, house well, well, or something. Yeah, it would be or, mm -hmm. or something like that. But, I, yes, I just don't think, like, somebody was like, oh, I have a room full of guitars. So, you know, my thought is whoever bought that guitar originally was probably not a collector. They were probably a professional musician of some kind mm -hmm. and felt like, yeah, this is a lot of money, but this is how I make my living, so I'm going to buy it. And, and then it got passed down and other people, you know, bought it. And, and I don't know, it's just, uh, it's kind of a cool thing to think that you have a piece of that. And, um, you know, I've, I've owned 50s Strats and, and Tellys in the past, but mine were always player guitars. They right. weren't, yeah. you know, excellent plus um, I've had some that have been repainted and, and one that where the pickup was rewired and so I've never really gone the you know 30 plus thousand dollar route where you're trying to get it all original and then not yeah. touch it I've kind of always bought them where they've been workhorses but there's still something special about it you know I mean, it's got to be said the landscape as barren as it is is beautiful yeah we're getting a the start of a sunset. A 
over the horizon. It's one of the nice things that I like about Arizona is the sun sets every night early. Just some of the most majestic you've ever seen. <laughs> fairly close by in Waco there are some some places of interest that next time we should uh, we should check out I understand the yeah, it's, it, it's not that close by it's uh, it's north of where we're gonna be but yeah they right. have the uh, the Texas Ranger Museum and the Dr. Pepper Museum <laughs> so I used to live uh, when I lived out here I lived in Austin and I lived in Temple Texas right. and when I lived in Temple I was maybe 45 minutes away from Waco, so I used to take people there to go to the, the two museums. <clears throat> Which would you take them to first? It's a, it's a toss-up. It really kind of just depends. Austin's a fun city. So San Antonio. We're going to be kind of right in between them. San Antonio has a bat bridge, and it's a bridge that underneath the bridge lives the largest population of a certain kind of bat in the entire world, like well over a million. Oh. And um, I, it's certain, it's not the whole year, it, but it's like maybe eight months out of the year, um, every night at dusk, like literally as the sun goes down, a million, million and a half bats all take off. And, and you can just watch them for about 25 minutes as they're all just flying. And it's pretty amazing. They go out to feed and then they come back and um, I've never seen them come back, but I've watched them take off a couple times. It's, you're never really fully prepared for how many there are and how long it takes. And what's wild is, you know, you show up at like around 5 o'clock and it's just a, br a bridge, you know, like mm -hmm. nothing to it. And then at about 6 o'clock or so, you start to hear like the rustling and the yeah. noise of all these bats kind of waking each other up and like, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? And then, you know, one or two kind of take off, and then five or ten take off, and then all of a sudden it's like, it's on like Donkey Kong, and every, everybody flies out. Oh, man, um, I love that. It's, it's pretty cool. And then uh, you've got the Riverwalk, the Alamo. Um, so there's some cool things in San Antonio. And then Austin is, you know, this great music town. Um, right. When I lived there, uh, it was pretty neat. They had a place called Pete's Dueling Piano Bar, which was one of the first dueling piano bars. The Dueling Piano? Yeah. You ever been to one of those? I've never been to one of those. Oh, it's incredible. So you get these musicians, usually like six or eight of them, and they do they work in teams of two, and you have two pianos up on stage, and the two musicians will come out, and it's basically like, you know, you can request any song, you know, on the planet, and one of the two of them knows how to play it. And you know, they'll play off each other and they'll, you know, get the audience up there to sing and stuff. Beautiful. So it's just like, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive because you think to have that kind of repertoire, you know, and be able to, you know, sing and play and do any song, no matter how obscure it is, is pretty neat. But so we'd go there and then Babes was the place where Steve Ray Vaughn got his start. 
Stephen Ray Vaughan was, was an important figure in your life, wasn't he? Yeah, um, well, uh, you know, interestingly enough, not so much while he was alive. I, uh, I was at the show the night before he died and the night that he died. Both of those took place in Milwaukee. And um, what I remember about the, the show the night before, um, it was supposed to start at like 7 o'clock at night. And on the radio that day, like that morning, they started telling people to show up at around 2. And I think they took the stage around 4, but they played from like 4 until 11 o'clock at night. And it was um, Robert Cray, and then Stevie Ray Vaughan, then Eric Clapton. Then they brought on Jeff Healy and Bonnie Raitt to like play with them. Wow. Jimmy Vaughan. And then they all came up on stage afterwards and jammed for like an hour and a half. And... <clears throat> I went there to go see Eric Clapton. I was a huge Clapton fan, and the reason, uh, you know, we got, like, front row and backstage passes because my mom had a company at the time that had given the loan to the family that opened the amphitheater that the concert was at, so that was my birthday present for the year, was to go to that concert and basically get to see Eric Clapton and all that fun stuff, and so we went to the show, and what I remember about it is I, I, I don't really... I'm not cognizant of having heard about Steve Ray Vaughan before that. And what I remember is he got up on stage and I have never seen a performance like that in my life. Really? It was like an hour and a half of high energy, incredible playing, running around the stage. Um, I mean, it was magical. And then Clapton came on, who's, you know, was like my idol. And it was almost like a, a downer, you know. Like he, <laughs> What's left? He like took the stage and you're like, oh, man. And then the next night, the night that he actually died, the show was good, but it was nowhere near the, the night before. So the, the, the first show was on Saturday, August, I think it was like the 28th or 29th. And then the next show was on Sunday. And what was crazy about it is that next, that Monday morning, I started school. And I remember we were driving to school and on the radio, they were saying that a helicopter had crashed and Eric Clapton had died. Oh my God. And, you know, because at the time there was no real accountability and I guess like the Civil Air Patrol, that they were at a place called Alpine Valley, which is a ski resort. It's relative because it's in Wisconsin. It's not like, you know, the, the Rockies or anything, but um, basically there's a large ski hill, you know, right behind this amphitheater. And as the helicopter was taking off, it was really foggy and windy, and it might have even been raining. And they basically crashed into the side of the mountain. But nobody had any accountability until they all got to Chicago, right. you know, later that night and started figuring out, like, where is everybody? So the initial news report was that Eric Clapton had died. Oh and God. then uh, a couple hours later, they said it was Eric Clapton's manager, somebody else, Steve Ray Vaughan. Like, you know, there were four people. Um, that had died in the crash. Um, yeah, it was really surreal. And then after that, I really became a huge Steve Ray Vaughan fan and started listening to him a lot and just found his music to be incredible. And it's like now, as with many musicians that you discover after, you know, they're prime, you go back and watch all these videos. You're like, how did I not, you know, how did I not know about him? How did I not go see him every chance I got? You know, it's just, so it's kind of missed opportunity. One of the things that strikes me about this is that, you know, pre-GPS, you could take a wrong turn and end up, you know, five, eight hundred miles away from your intended destination without without realizing it. That's, yeah, and most states are smaller, so you hit something where you're like, oh, it hits something this, isn't, this yeah. isn't where we want to be, but in Texas, you could just, you either hit a river in the south... <laughs> The Rockies in the north, you know. <clears throat> I mean, you, it literally takes like 20 hours to drive across the state. So that's 20 hours of mistakes you could be making, you know, if you don't know your 
geography, like if you didn't have a map or you didn't know where the cities are. Yeah, because when we went through El Paso, you, you pointed out a couple of signposts to a place that was like 800 miles away. Yeah. And you said that's not even the center of the state. Yeah. You know, it's like. I, that wasn't on the far end of the state. That wasn't the far yeah, end of the state. Yeah. Yeah, it was probably two thirds of the way across. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's a big state. And as you see when we drive, there's a lot of, you know, 80, 100 miles in between gas stations, rest stops, that kind of stuff. So, you know, when I lived here, I was always told you don't ever drive anywhere without half a tank of gas because we, I had, I've had i had experiences where, you know, you're like, oh, I'll make it. You know, I, right. I have 200 miles to go, um, you know, so I'm, that's more than enough distance to go to get to a gas station. So you go 80, 90, 100 miles to that next gas station, but it's 9 o'clock at night and they're closed. And, you know, so it's like, yeah, it's physically there, but you still can't get gas. <laughs> so now you go again and you're the whole time you're like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's just, it's an interesting place. You have to kind of adapt, you know, how you, how you survive or, or just exist live here and you know people that live here are just used to it but if you're not from here you can definitely see how things could go wrong in these long trips absolutely and you know we're on a we're on the major highway that goes east west through texas but there's a lot of you know smaller roads that are still you know major roads but like you're not going to have the throughput there so you can like break down and maybe another car comes by, maybe they don't, you know? So it's, it's always interesting. What I like is we're passing a lot of exit signs. You know, normally it says like exit here to go to yeah. name the city, right? And we pass a lot of, it just says exit up ahead, but Let there's like no, no notion of like what you're, you know, no road that you're getting onto, no town that you're gonna see. It's just like, you can get off here if you want. Yeah, it's just an exit. It's completely up to you. <laughs> what happens after that is not our issue. When I was a kid, we used to take a lot of road trips. And, you know, pre-GPS, you had to, like, you know, have a map. Or I remember when the atlases came out, and it was like, you could have, like, a, the whole country in a big, you know, book. One book. <clears throat> and, you know, my dad, you know, about every 200 miles, we'd stop for gas. And my dad and I would go, like, stand out on the hood of the car and... You'd have like a highlighter or a pencil, and you know, like here's the route we're gonna take, and you know, we're gonna take this road for this long, and when we get to this city, you're gonna look for this highway and stuff. And it's interesting because then when I went into the military, obviously, I was in the military before GPS, mm -hmm. and so everything was map and compass, and reading a map and orienting and knowing, you know, cardinal directions and where the sun is and stuff like that was just kind of second nature to me. And years later, as I was getting out of the military, and we had people coming in whose entire life had been around GPS, they struggled to, like, orient a map properly or look at it and identify terrain features and, you know, things like that. And, you know, we used to land, land navigation, and I'd be out with a group of people, and, you know, they, you'd be like, um, okay... We're about to cross over a mountain. And they're like, yes. It's like, do you see a mountain on the map in the direction that we should be traveling? I don't know. Well, if you knew, you would know that there's no mountain there. <laughs> so the fact that we're about to go over a mountain should be a key indicator for you that we are currently heading in the wrong direction. And my job, you know, is to just kind of like help you know, help them with the discovery learning. <laughs> but you would sit there and you're like, I'm going to walk over a freaking mountain now just because this idiot doesn't know that we're not supposed to walk over a mountain. And there was a lot of moments like that where, you know, <clears throat> or <clears throat> I'm going to take this path because it looks like the fastest route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. Do you see that blue line that we're going to cross over? Uh-huh. Do, do you know what that is? Uh, a boundary? 
know. That blue line is a large river, roughly a mile and a half wide, and probably 400 feet deep. And it's called the Mississippi. <laughs> and, and I don't feel like you're going to want to ford across it with your 200 pounds of gear. And <laughs> You know. Yeah. And then you get to the desert, and there's no train features. <laughs> exactly. What and you, and you, you get this map that, like, has a, a, a 10 meter change in elevation over 70 miles, you know, and you're like, huh. It's essentially and, just a shade yeah, of sandpaper. Yeah, and that's another one, and since all of the landmarks are temporary, you know, there's no permanent buildings, you're driving, I mean, that's, again, that was a huge thing for me, it's like, you realize, thank God we have GPS, because, I, I you know, I can't imagine, like, the, the British SAS in North Africa in World War II, you know, where it's just like, drive west, <laughs> you know, and, and get to this wadi or something, and it's like, I, I don't know, I mean, it's... It's pretty fascinating. That was the the best Western hotel there. What uh, what do you think the best Western was, Jason? Young Guns. <laughs> really? <laughs> Stop that just there for a moment. Uh, it's Michael Watts from the future here. I'm in London, back in London now, and in fact, um, I'm at the headquarters of Sound Network, uh, playing with some beautiful DPA mics. I'll tell you more about these in the future. Um, my weekend in Texas was a, an absolutely unforgettable experience. So thank you so much to uh, to Tom Bowersox and family and everybody who was involved. It was just uh, just a beautiful thing to be a part of. Um, now, I was very busy during the weekend. I had a lot of teaching to do. I had a group masterclass, one-on-ones, uh, a concert to play, all sorts of stuff. So I didn't really get the chance to do much filming. Um, although I did manage to catch this interview with our host, Tom Bowersox, on the second day. Well, it's uh, day two of the uh, Texas B.I.G. Guitar Palooza, and I'm here with our host for the weekend, the wonderful Mr. Tom Bowersox. Tom, congratulations and thank you for an extraordinary weekend. It really has been wonderful. Well, I thank you too. And I think what made the weekend wonderful, people like you coming and the guests. It's joy. Yeah, it's, it's been a spectacular weekend. We've had some incredible guitar playing talent, some beautiful music and um, right here in, in Texas. It's, it's just been a joy to see the state as well. Yes. Except for the gale that came through while we had Michael all set up on the beautiful veranda to do a workshop. 30 mile an hour gale came across the yard. Well, you, you can't account for everything, can you? But uh, <laughs> no. it, it has been a, a tremendous success. Thank you for inviting us all to your beautiful home. And uh, what, was the, what was the spark that, uh, that started this whole thing for you? Yeah, I've been to the big shows, and you know, there's no, everybody knows what those are without naming them. And it's always so overwhelming with just the sheer numbers of guitars and the crowds, and and you feel like you're just part of the big puzzle, and you don't get any personal feel for. It. And I, I just thought I wanted to get a more intimate event, and I have mm -hmm. made connections with a lot of luthiers that I know are great people, and it started with them. And then you, and all of a sudden we have this event that's going to be like a house concert, but with the added benefit of luthiers and mm. world-class instruments and good food and fun. Oh, the food was good. So it just seemed like it was a niche that needed to be, not necessarily needed to be filled, but hadn't been filled, and mm -hmm. we wanted to take the chance to do that. Well, thank you. I'm very glad you did, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much for coming. Sorry about the lack of footage from the weekend. Here's a slideshow and some music in the background. After a 2,000 mile road trip and uh, some incredible landscapes as we uh, drove through New Mexico and Texas, uh, we're back here at one of my favorite places in the world, the uh, headquarters of Coastal Guitars. And um, one of the things that really struck me uh, this weekend was watching Jason deliver a new guitar, a bespoke instrument for one of his clients. Jason, what goes through your head when uh, you hand over a new guitar for the first time? Well, you know, mostly uh, you're just kind of excited, excited to be at that stage because it's kind of the handoff, right? Like I've had the guitar in my hands for months now and, um, you know, you're, you're ready to pass it on and let somebody start to enjoy it. You know everything they asked for in the guitar, you know what they wanted out of it. And so as you pass it off, you're kind of anxiously anticipating their first impression and, and hoping that it meets their expectations, that it does the things they want it to do. So there's always, it's a lot of excitement, and then there's a little bit of apprehension, you know, as with anything where you're kind of putting it out there to be evaluated. Of course, of course. And uh, tell us a little bit about the, the guitar in question. It was an MDW model. Wasn't it was. It was an MDW, German spruce top, uh, African blackwood, back and sides, cocoa bolo binding, mm -hmm. and um, just a beautiful guitar all around. The, the client actually did most of the design elements on the guitar. He's really uh, adept at using Photoshop, so he would send me little pictures of like, hey, can we do this? And um, I would tweak it here and there so that the proportions or the sense of design was a little bit more in line with what I yeah, wanted style. on the guitar, but, but ultimately all the ideas were his. So it was pretty exciting yeah. to have him be a part of that process and, and kind of, you know, help me with the creation of the guitar. Wonderful. Well, it was a, a beautiful moment, as you've seen from the pictures, and, uh, and a fitting way to bring this particular episode of Luthia Stories to a close. So thank you to Jason. Thank you. Thank you to Tom Bowersox and his family out in Spring Branch, Texas for organizing the inaugural uh, BIG uh, Guitar Festival. And thank you to you for watching. Until next time, stay tuned.